morning, everyone. So today we're going to hear from Dr. Michael Stout, who is head of the Department of Entomology at LSU, interim head of the School of Plant and Environmental and Soil Sciences, and co-director of the Center for Research Excellence in Plant Biotechnology and Crop Development. So lots of stuff. Um, his current research interests include integrated pest management, specifically focused on plant resistance as a tactic in IPM programs, induced resistance, the biochemical basis of plant resistance, as well as plant soil feedback. Uh, he has received several awards for his research, most recently the Distinguished Rice Research and Education Team Award from the Rice uh, Technical Working Group and the Doyle Chambers Career Research Award from LSU Ag Center. Um, I run across his papers all the time looking at weevil work and I'm really excited to uh, hear him talk. And on top of all the stuff that he does, he was nice enough to respond to a random email from a random grad student and come give us this talk. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Stout and yeah, thanks. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Emily. And I'm going to trust that there are people out there listening to this because I don't see anybody, which is kind of a strange experience. But I, I do want to thank Emily and, and the Department of Entomology at Purdue for inviting me to give this talk. And um, I'm going to talk about the use of plant phenotypic plasticity and pest management of course, focusing in rice, but hopefully framing it broadly enough uh, so that it's relevant to those of you that work in other crops. And uh, hopefully we can have a discussion at the end. I probably need to hurry a little bit because I'm under a strict 45 minute uh, time limit here. So let me get going. <clears throat> I can figure out how to work this. Okay, so let me start here uh, with thank yous and acknowledgements so that I don't forget to do this at the end. A lot of the work that you're going to see me present is the work of three graduate students, three PhD students that I've had over the past 10 years. Uh, first one's Emily Krauss. She's actually a, a Purdue alum. Uh, James Viegas and Lena Berneola are two other PhD students. And then Santhi Bavanam was a postdoc in my lab for the last couple of years, she's gone now, and then acknowledging my funding sources as well. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is I want to give you an overview, a very short overview of plant phenotypic plasticity, what it, what it is and, and how, can, how it can be used in pest management. Then I'll give you a bit of background about rice in Louisiana and the pest complex in rice since uh, I know that not a, not a lot of rice is grown in Indiana, so and some of you may not be familiar with the crop. I'll then cover three hypotheses that, we've, that my lab has investigated over the years, and then I'll finish up with some general thoughts on using phenotypic plasticity in pest management. Okay, so plant phenotypic plasticity, and, and all of you are familiar with the concept, I'm sure, of phenotypic plasticity. And all we mean here is that the, the phenotype of a plant depends on the environment in which it is grown. And here's a particularly striking example of phenotypic plasticity, heterophily in, in this aquatic plant, where the form of the leaf varies dramatically depending on the temperature at which the plant is grown. Now, in terms of plant resistance, what we are mostly focusing on here in this talk is the fact that the resistance phenotypes of plants are plastic and are influenced by the environment. And in particular, we're interested in uh, the phenomenon that's called induced resistance. And so this cartoon here hopefully will illustrate what I'm talking about. So beginning with a susceptible phenotype, a susceptible plant phenotype, when that plant comes under attack by insects or other kinds of stresses, the plant undergoes a number of, of processes. Uh, the plant, first of all, has to recognize that it is under attack. Uh, then there are a series of local and systemic signaling events that uh, involve plant hormones, notably jasmonic acid and salicylic acid. These hormonal signaling changes result in changes in uh, gene and metabolite expression. And sometimes these changes in gene expression are quite dramatic and quite comprehensive. So you're getting a comprehensive transcriptomic reorganization of the plant. And as a result of those changes, 
you and the expression of resistance related metabolites, the plant becomes or, or expresses a resistant phenotype. So uh, historically, the focus in integrated pest management has been on varietal resistance. So using different genotypes of a crop that express resistance to a given pest. And there's, even though plant phenotypic plasticity is kind of a hot topic in plant biology right now, the implications of plant phenotypic plasticity for the management of insect pests have, have been largely or remain largely unexplored. But there are reasons to think that phenotypic plasticity might be important to pest management. And this is just kind of a very brief argument for why phenotypic plasticity might be important. We know that, the, as I've said, the resistance phenotype of a crop plant depends on the environment in which it's grown, and in particular, the history of the interactions of the plant with biotic and ab abiotic stresses can uh, change the resistance phenotype of a crop plant. And so we also know that the environment of a crop plant is at least partially under the control of the farmer who does things like fertilize the crop and irrigate the crop and so on. So because two, those two things are true, a farmer might be able to optimize the expression of the resistance of a crop plant by manipulating the crop environment. And so I think there's reason to think that phenotypic plasticity could be adopted to help us in pest management. So my lab has been looking into this idea over the past 15, 20 years. And uh, so to, to see if we can use phenotypic, phenotypic plasticity to manage rice pests. So before I get into uh, the hypotheses that my lab has been investigating, I need to give you a little bit of background about rice in Louisiana. And so rice in Louisiana, as in most other, well, rice in Louisiana is a direct seeded crop, unlike most of the rest of the world. But like the rest of the world, rice is grown under flooded conditions for most of the season. So typically what is done in Louisiana is that the rice is direct seeded, uh, typically with a, a, tip, uh, a kind of a normal drill seeding apparatus. Uh, and then it is allowed, the plants are allowed to establish for somewhere around three weeks to four weeks without a flood. And once the rice enters its tillering phase, uh, the, a permanent flood is applied to the field. And generally speaking, that flood is maintained until a few weeks before harvest when the field is drained uh, to dry out for, to, to get the, the harvesting equipment in. Now, there are a lot of pests that feed on rice in the southern US uh, throughout the season. And uh, of course, we don't have time to talk about all of those pests. We're going to focus on a few major pests. And I'm going to go into some detail about each one of these pests, where all of these that are shown here, except for this one, this is a rice stink bug, which is a major late season pest. But I'm not going to talk about it today. So what I will talk about is. Uh, the fall armyworm, which is an occasional pest of seedling rice. And then this pest here, which is called the rice water weevil, which is our major insect pest in rice. And then I'll talk about a complex of stem boring species that attack rice later in the season, more towards the reproductive phases of development. So let me spend, I'll spend most of the time in this talk talking about the rice water weevil and it really is the most important, economically important pest of rice in Louisiana and, and in the Southern US. And it's really the key pest in terms of uh, pest management. So this is an insect that uh, overwinters as an adult and it overwinters in uh, riparian areas, mostly under leaf litter or uh, in bunch grasses. And then as it begins to warm up in spring, usually around March uh, and uh, mid-March to early April, it emerges from its diapause and its overwintering phase and it flies to rice fields and it feeds as an adult on the leaves of young rice plants, leaves these characteristic 
scars that are uh, oriented longitudinally uh, parallel to the leaf venation. E adult feeding is economically not super important. Uh, one really key aspect of the biology of this insect is that the females generally don't lay very many eggs until rice is flooded. So flooding is a, an environmental cue that triggers egg laying. So you get mating, the eggs are laid below the water surface in the leaf sheaths of, rice, of young rice plants. Those eggs hatch and the larvae that result move down to the roots where the larvae pass through four larval stages and a pupal stage under flooded conditions. And, uh, and then the uh, adults emerge and go through either another generation or they go back to overwintering. So that's the basic life cycle of the insect. Here's a, uh, a photograph of the larva. Again, this larva is developing on rice roots uh, that are the, under a flooded conditions. And you can see here uh, where it has taken a little bite out of this rice root. You can see it's, tracheal system here. And a really interesting aspect of the biology of this insect is that its spiracles are modified to pierce the roots. And so the insect is not only obtaining its food from the roots, but it's also obtaining air or oxygen from arenchyma that are present in the roots of rice. So you can see what results when you've got a serious infestation. This is a root system that has been unprotected from rice water weevil larval feeding. And this is a root system that's been protected. You can see that the feeding by the larvae can result in severe pruning. And you see over here some plots. These plots in the middle are unprotected or have, or have not been protected from the rice water weevil. And you can see how much thinner they are than the plots that have been protected. So you get fairly dramatic yield losses from this root pruning, we can see losses in excess of, yield losses in excess of 20%. And when you look at the yield components, you're, you'll see reductions in shoot biomass, you'll see reductions in tillering of the plant and at harvest reductions in numbers of panicles. You see reductions in grains per panicle and you see reductions in grain weight. So this really is the most serious insect pest of rice in the entire United States. It's also invasive in other parts of the world. It's invaded many parts of, of Asia as well as Europe. The rice water weevil is a multi voltine pest. And uh, so what I'm showing here is some data that was generated by a visiting scientist from China in my lab uh, about 20 years ago. And she looked at uh, population dynamics of weevils in our rice fields. And what she saw was there's generally two peaks of adult abundance in rice fields. So this first peak is the insects that are entering the field from overwintering sites. And then here you have a, a period of larval de development. And then here you have that second peak, which are the adults that are emerging from, uh, from the development on the roots. There's generally only a single peak of larvae per field, but larvae are present for uh, between zero and 70 days of flooding. So they're present for most of the field season. Okay, so I'm not, in this talk, I'm not going to give you too many details about uh, methodologies that we've used, but I did wanna mention a couple of things when we assess the resistance of rice plants uh, in the field, this is the process that we use. We actually take core samples, uh, root and soil core samples from the field. Uh, we bring them back to a wash shed. We wash the mud off the root systems, wash the larvae off of the roots into screen mesh buckets. And then we count the larvae and pupae that we've that we've washed off the roots. And so our index of, of infestation is larvae and pupae per core sample. That's, so you'll see me present a lot of data showing larvae and pupae per, per core sample. And, and that's how we got those numbers. 
When we do experiments in the greenhouse, we use a slightly different method. So we infest uh, rice uh, with rice water weevil adults in cages, in benches that can be flooded. And those adults that we infest the plants with will lay their eggs. So you see a picture of the egg here. We then remove the plants from the soil, bring them back to the lab, and we monitor the emergence of those first instars from the plants. They, they emerge in these test tubes and we count and they, they sink to the bottom of the test tube. And then we can count the number of neonate or first instar larvae per plant. So when I talk about greenhouse experiments, I'll present uh, data in terms of neonates per plant or larvae per plant. Okay, so that's all I, I think I need to say about the rice water weevil for, for the time being. Let me cover a couple of other pests that are problems in Louisiana rice. One is the fall armyworm. And the fall armyworm is a convenient model for sure. It's really just a sporadic pest in the field. It's prim primarily a pest of early season rice before you flood the fields. And of course, it's a defoliator. So here you see uh, fall armyworm larva chewing on a rice plant, and it can cause pretty severe reductions in stand, rice stand before flooding. So you see here an area where uh, fall armyworm larvae have kind of marched through the field and taken out a lot of plants. It's not a, it's not a key economic pest, it's more like a sporadic pest for us. And then the final pest I'll talk about are stem borers. We actually have a complex of stem boring species. As it turns out over the last five to 10 years, uh, this particular species has emerged as our biggest problem, Mexican rice borer. It invaded Louisiana from the, from the west, from Texas. Uh, Texas has a smaller rice producing industry or rice industry than Louisiana, but uh, the insect uh, invaded from the west, from Texas, and it, has now, it is now present in all rice producing parishes of Louisiana, which is mostly Southwest Louisiana. And so this is, as the name implies, a stem boring insect. So the larvae bore into the stems of rice and the symptoms of infestation, at least at the later stages of crop development are these structures called whiteheads. The insect is fed below this panicle and has cut off the supply of photosynthate to the grains. And so the grains are basically empty and total yield loss for that panicle. So this is a, an emerging threat for the rice industry in Louisiana. And again, present in all rice producing parishes. The primary management tactic for all of our rice pests is still insecticides. Uh, in the 20 years that I've been working on rice in Louisiana, we have made a transition from the use of an insecticide called furidan, which is a carbamate. It was used as a post-flood larvicide. We've transitioned away from the use of this insecticide, which is now banned by the, by the EPA. And the rice industry now uses almost exclusively seed treatments. So there are three seed treatment insecticides that are labeled uh, this one here called Dermacor, which is chlorantronilaprol, and then a couple of neonic neonicotinoids like Cruiser Max, and the other one's called Nipsin. So insecticides are still our primary management tactic. Now, when I arrived in Louisiana uh, 20, 20 plus years ago, one of the things that I wanted to look at was varietal resistance. And so we have done a number of experiments over the years looking at the resistance of various genotypes of rice to the rice water weevil and uh, spent a lot of time doing this with uh, fairly little to show for it. Uh, you can see here the results of a typical experiment and you can see here that there is some variation in resistance to the rice water weevil, but it really, all commercial rice varieties are susceptible to the rice water weevil and the levels of varietal resistance that we see are not very high at all. Now, consistently what we have seen is this variety here called Jefferson possesses low levels of resistance and our medium grain varieties like this one here called Jupiter are typically more susceptible to the rice water weevil. But again, 
very limited in terms of potential for a management tactic. We have done some work with the breeders in order to develop more resistant high yielding varieties. So here are, here's a picture of an experiment that we did in which we worked with a breeder to cross Cocodry, which was a, a very popular variety with Jefferson, that resistant variety that I mentioned earlier. And uh, these are this, uh, in 2017, we were kind of, we were in the F4, approximately the F4 generation. And we succeeded in introgressing some resistance into the progeny, but again, the levels of resistance that we were able to breed into this hybrid, these, these lines were not super high and really had limited usefulness in a management program. So of course, sole reliance on insecticides is undesirable, but uh, varietal resistance in rice to the rice water weevil has been insufficient or just low levels of resistance. And so really the question that we've been exploring over the past 10, 15 years is can we exploit phenotypic plasticity in rice resistance to rice pests uh, in pest management? So I'm gonna talk about uh, three hypotheses that we've explored over the years, my graduate students and I. Uh, the first hypothesis that I'm gonna talk about is uh, the hypothesis that early season pests might affect the type, severity, and community of late season pests. And so what we're talking about here are plant mediated effects of early season herbivory on later season herbivory. This work was mostly done by uh, Emily Krauss, a graduate student, my PhD student. And um, she was again, interested in this question of does early season herbivory affect pest incidence or severity later in the season. And uh, she looked at three separate questions and I'm gonna take them one at a time. The first question that she looked at was, does fall armyworm defoliation before flooding affect rice water wheel populations after flooding? So early season attack by fall armyworm, does that affect rice water weevil populations after flooding? Because remember, rice water weevil larvae don't appear in fields until after you put a flood on. So this is the question that she was investigating, whether feeding by this insect here, the fall armyworm, affects this insect here, the rice water weevil. Her hypothesis was that defoliation by fall armyworm might be inducing resistance to the rice water weevil in terms of rice water weevil oviposition or survival, and that might lead to a reduction in larval densities. So the experimental protocol she used, and again, I'm not gonna go into details here. We had a laboratory colony of fall armyworm. We uh, placed enclosures out in the field, placed the fall armyworm into the enclosures, let them feed, then we flooded the rice, and then later on we monitored or determined levels or densities of rice water weevil larvae on the roots of rice plants. These are some results, and this is some experiments that we did in 2015. What you can see here is she did three experiments in 2015. She took two core samples per experiment, and the open bars are the controls or, or non-defoliated enclosures or non-defoliated rice, and then the dark bars are defoliated rice. And what you can see is that intermittently or occasionally in, in three of the six core sampling events, she saw a significant reduction in uh, rice water weevil larvae and, and, and pupae per core sample, but it wasn't a consistent effect. So she didn't, she saw an inconsist, inconsistent effect of fall armyworm defoliation on later populations of the rice water weevil. She did this again in 2016, and those results were, uh, again, uh, no consistent effect of fall armyworm defoliation on rice water weevil feeding. And she's published these results a few years back. <clears throat> so uh, that was that first question. The second question that she looked at was, does early attack by rice water weevils reduce later season attack by the rice water weevil? And let me remind you of the population dynamics of the rice water weevil. 
um, well, I don't have that slide here, but remember rice water weevils are kind of a constant presence in rice fields after flooding. So they're present from, from right after flooding until at least 70 days after flooding. So they're around. So she wanted to see whether er that early season attack by rice water weevils reduced later season attack. She looked at this question first in a, a greenhouse experiment, and she asked the question of whether feeding by weevil larvae on the roots induces resistance to weevil overposition above in above ground portions of the plant. So remember, the larvae are feeding on the roots, but the adults are, lay, are feeding and laying their eggs uh, on the leaves and, uh, and in the leaf sheet. So very simple experiment. She infested roots of rice seedlings with larvae. So here you can see this is a rice plant. Here you can see a larva. She actually placed the larvae at the base of the plant and then the larvae burrowed down to the roots. Of course, she had controls that were not infested. She let the larvae feed on the roots for approximately two weeks. Then she infested plants with adult females and counted first instars that emerged from these plants that she had infested with adult females. So here's what she saw, pretty clear result that feeding by weevil larvae on the roots of rice plants induces resistance to subsequent infestation. So either oviposition by females or survival of those early instars as they hatch from eggs. So here you have a uh, number of larvae first instar emerging from control plants and number of first instars emerging from plants that were previously infested with weevils. So that was a pretty clear result, at least in the greenhouse. She looked at another aspect of this, of, of above ground, below ground interactions by looking to see whether uh, feeding by weevil adults induces resistance to weevil oviposition. So again, adults feed on the leaves, they leave these characteristic scars. And so she subjected rice seedlings to adult feeding. And in this case, she used male weevils, so there was no egg laying. And she did this under unflooded conditions to further uh, suppress any possible egg laying that uh, might be occurred by a stray female that got in there. She uh, counted the scarring on the leaves and then after that, she infested plants with adult females and then let those females lay their eggs and she counted the first instars emerging from plants. And again, she saw a little bit weaker of a result here, but fairly clear. Uh, here you have on the x-axis, you have the number of scars per plant. And here on the y-axis, number of immatures that were emerging uh, from those plants and you see a negative relationship, the, num the greater the number of scars, Jupiter is the variety of rice, the greater the number of scars on these Jupiter plants, the fewer rice water weevil first instars that emerged from, uh, from the plant. So feeding by weevil larvae on the roots, oh, I'm sorry, feeding by, this, this title is, is incorrect, feeding by weevil adults on the leaves induces resistance to subsequent infestation. So uh, just to summarize these greenhouse experiments, feeding by adults on leaves may induce some resistance to later oviposition or first instar survival. Feeding by weevil larvae on roots of rice plants induces resistance to later oviposition or first instar survival on above ground portions of the plants. But the question, of course, was do these effects extend to the field? Well, Emily uh, graduated before she was able to actually look at uh, this, these questions under field conditions. Last year was the first year that I got a chance to, uh, to look at this question. And um, it's actually kind of a difficult question to get at in the field. But we reasoned that if early season, so remember here that weevil, uh, weevil larvae are present in the field uh, for most of the season after flooding and adults are also present for most of the season. So we reasoned that if early season weevil feeding induces resistance to later season weevil infestation, that if we suppressed weevils early in the season, that might lead to higher susceptibility and higher populations later in the season. So, uh, so th this red line here represents uh, larval 
numbers or our larval densities in a typical situation. And the green line represents what we thought might happen if we suppressed uh, weevils early in the season and then released that suppression, we thought we might see a, a greater number of weevil larvae later in the season. That's what we thought might happen. It's a very difficult, or it turns out it's a pretty difficult question to get at in the field. Uh, this is our first stab at it. This is a results from uh, last field season. And what we tried to do here is, uh, and this data has not been analyzed yet, so I apologize for that. But uh, what we did in this experiment was uh, on the x-axis here is days after flooding and y-axis is rice water weevils per core. Focus here on the gray line, which is our untreated plots and the blue line, which is our, our insecticide treated plots. And what I did was I suppressed weevil numbers early in the season in my karate, my insecticide treatment. And then I looked at populations of weevils later on in the season. And as it turns out, here's our controls and here's our uh, numbers from our karate treatment, where again, the weevils have been suppressed early in the season. And we see, we don't see what I predicted. So we don't see any boost in weevil numbers or weevil densities, larval densities later in the season in, uh, in plots where the weevils had been suppressed earlier in the season. Now, uh, one of the difficulties here, of course, is what about all that insecticide that you're spraying early in the season? Could it be just residual, residual toxicity? We uh, did check that possibility. I took some weevils, adult weevils, and placed them on excised leaves from my control and karate treatments. And um, I saw no difference in adult mortality. But um, again, uh, we need to try this, perhaps using a different method in coming field seasons to kind of verify this result. Uh, Another question that I wanted to ask in the field was, does early season attack by rice water weevils reduce infestations by stem borers way later in the season? So remember, stem borers are, are mostly coming into rice fields towards the end of the season when the rice goes into its reproductive phase. So again, uh, so here's our weevil population dynamics and stem borers are coming in, let's say 70 to 90 days after flooding. So uh, we used the same experimental protocol, actually the same field plots. And so just a reminder, these are the plots where we suppressed rice water weevils with insecticides. Here's our control plots. And then we counted whiteheads 70, basically 70 days after flooding. And we expected if rice water weevil, rice water weevils were inducing resistance to, uh, to stem borers later in the season, we would expect uh, lower numbers on our, uh, on, our, uh, <clears throat> on our controls relative to our karate and our cruiser max treatments, but that's not what we saw. We basically saw no difference in whiteheads per plot in any of our treatments, which suggests that that early season weevil feeding is not inducing resistance to stem borers later in the season. Now, again, this is one experiment. We probably need to do it. We need to approach it probably with some uh, different experimental protocols. But right now, uh, what we see based on these preliminary experiments is that plant-mediated interactions among pests in the field do not appear to be strong. So we see effects in the greenhouse, uh, but not so much so far, at least, in the field. So we don't see real strong plant mediated effects or induced resistance uh, in the field. Okay, so that was, uh, hopefully I'm doing okay on time. Uh, that was our uh, first hypothesis. The second hypothesis that we wanted to look at was whether plant resistance can be directly manipulated using phytohormones, and in this case, methyl jasminate. For those of you uh, that um, maybe aren't familiar with this field, methyl jasminate is a plant hormone that, uh, that is involved in plant responses to insect feeding. And uh, numerous people have shown that you can uh, apply 
methyl jasmine A2 plants and induce resistance. So we wanted to see if we could do that. Uh, we did a number of experiments along these lines, but I wanna just talk about some experiments that we've done with uh, seed treatments. So here, very simple experiment. We treated seeds with solutions of methyl jasmine, this plant hormone uh, at various concentrations, zero, one and five millimolar. We simply soaked the seeds uh, in a lab and then we planted those, in this case, we, in a greenhouse experiment, we planted those seeds in a greenhouse, we grew the plants for two weeks, and then we infested with adults. And what you can see is that seed treatment with methyl jasmine induces, fairly clearly induces resistance against the rice water weevil. So here you see number of larvae emerging from plants in the zero millimolar, one millimolar, and five millimolar treatments. So that's fine, we could do that in a greenhouse. Um, and we also showed in a greenhouse experiment that the effect of the seed treatment erodes over time. So here is an experiment where we expose plants 15 days after seed treatment and you see the clear effect. And then at 29 days after seed treatment, the effect of the methyl, methyl jasmine, the, the resistance that's induced has begun to erode. So we approached this in the field. And again, I don't have time to go into all the details, but we soaked our seeds in the lab. Then we used those seeds to uh, plant small plots in the field, uh, water seeding, in other words, seeding into a flood. We then removed the flood to let the plants emerge. Then we reflooded the, the, plant, the plots and we assessed weevils. We looked at plant biomass and we also looked at yields on a per panicle basis. So you can see here, these are our small plots of rice that we've seeded with either methyl jasmine treated or untreated uh, solutions. We actually had a factorial design where we had an untreated control. We used insecticides to suppress weevils in some plots. Uh, we used the methyl jasmine at seed treatment. And then we also used a combination of insecticides and methyl jasmine. And uh, again, don't have too much time to go into the details here, but what we found was pretty clearly the methyl jasmine C treatment was uh, induced resistance to rice water weevils in the field. But uh, it, the, as you might expect, the effectiveness of the methyl jasmine C treatment was not as effective as uh, uh, repeated applications of our insecticide. So here you have rice water weevil densities in control plots, karate treated plots, and then methyl jasmine treated plots, and then plots treated with both karate and methyl jasmine. So we got about a 30% reduction in weevil densities compared to controls in our methyl jasmine treated plots. When we looked at yields, the patterns that we saw in yields were somewhat ambiguous. And, um, and that's because you've got two things going on. You've got uh, the weevil control, which again was not as effective in the methyl jasmine treatment as it was in the insecticide treatment, but you also have direct costs associated with inducing the resistance. So it's costly for plants to uh, express resistance-related traits. And so when you treat them with methyl jasmine, you expect kind of a yield penalty just from inducing the resistance. So we see here when you compare the grain yields or the, the panicle yields, in control plots with karate plots, here you see a, a clear effect, a clear boost from controlling those weevils. So weevils are clearly reducing grain yields. Uh, but the methyl jasmine treatment, when you look at the yields in these plots, no different from the control plots. Now is the question is, is this difference between karate treated plots and methyl jasmine treated plots due to ineffective control of the weevil or the cost of induction? And in the plots where we treated with both methyl jasmine and insecticide, those yields were about the same and not significantly different than the karate treated plots. So that suggests that maybe these lower yields in the methyl jasmine treatment was because of ineffective weevil control. Clearly, we have some work to do here. We did another experiment this past year in the greenhouse. And in this case, we didn't have any weevils around. So there was no yield penalty associated with infestation with weevils. And we looked at weight of filled grains 
under three treatments, control, jasmonic acid treated, and methyl jasminate. And here in the greenhouse, when there were no weevils present, we saw about a 30% reduction in yields simply due to the methyl jasminate treatment. So there is a cost associated with inducing that resistance. Okay, the conclusions from this methyl jasminate C treatment piece, C treatments of methyl jasminate or jasmonic acid can protect rice from rice water weevils in both the greenhouse and the field, uh, but jasminate treatment has a penalty. Uh, we saw, when I didn't show this data, but it delayed germination, it delays plant growth, uh, although those effects erode over time, but those C treatments can reduce rice yields in the absence of infestation. So further work's going to be needed to determine if the benefits of seed treatment, which is protection from insects, outweigh the cost, which is that uh, cost of inducing resistance under field conditions. And that's really the question that is facing us in future years to try to tease out that balance. Okay, final hypothesis that I want to discuss is whether soil amendments can be used to alter plant resistance and tolerance. And in this case, I had a graduate student who was interested in looking at mycorrhizae and whether mycorrhizal colonization can impact the resistance or tolerance of rice to rice water weevil. Uh, to do this, she used seed treatments to manipulate both weevil populations and uh, mycorrhizal colonization in the field. So she used an insecticide, seed treatment insecticide called Nipsit. It's, uh, it's a neonicotinoid. And she used a commercial mycorrhizal product called Endomax from Balin. Field study very briefly was we planted our rice in small plots. We had factorial combinations of mycorrhizae and insecticide. We applied our permanent flood, which triggers overposition by the weevils. At appropriate times, we came in and we sampled larvae. Uh, larval populations, estimated larval densities, and we also looked at plant growth and plot yields. And I'm going to really pass through this data fairly quickly here. Seed treatments with mycorrhizae did increase colonization of rice roots, so we did verify that the mycorrhizae were having the effect, and you can see some of the arbuscles and the, uh, the hyphae and so on in these rice roots. We also saw, as we'd seen in previous experiments that mycorrhizal colonization didn't induce resistance to, to rice water weevil, it actually induced susceptibility. So if you compare these light green bars here, these are four experiments done over three years. You compare the light green bars for each experiment, you can see that, that there's a slight but significant increase in the susceptibility of rice to the rice water weevil as measured by larvae per core sample. We also saw, interestingly enough, that uh, mycorrhizae also induce susceptibility to stem bore. So again, comparing uh, whiteheads per meter squared, and you're looking at the light green bars here for each experiment, and you can see significant increases in whiteheads per plot in mycorrhi mycorrhizae treated plots. Mycorrhizae uh, seed treatment also increased plant biomass, and uh, Lena, the graduate student who was doing this, she looked at this both before flooding and after flooding, and not to get into too many details, but before flooding, uh, the, the mycorrhizae increased root biomass, so you see that here, uh, and the effect was actually greater than that of the insecticide. After flooding, in contrast, she saw that the mycorrhizae increased shoot biomass, and the strength of the effect was similar to that of the insecticide, which is again, controlling the rice water weed. So mycorrhizae were clearly boosting plant growth. And we also found that inoculation with mycorrhizae using those seed treatments increased yields that we got from the, from the plants. And so we did this experiment four times. And in three of the four experiments, we saw significant yield increases in the mycorrhizae plots. So in the first experiment, a 5% yield boost, and the second and third, fourth experiments, we saw greater than 10% increases in yields. And it's important to point out here that we're getting those increases in yield 
despite these increases in weevil density. So here you see percent weevil in, uh, densities, percent increases in weevil densities, as well as these increases in whiteheads or stem borer infestation. So that leads us to speculate, to suggest that mycorrhizae might be increasing the tolerance of rice to insect pests, not necessarily the resistance because it's reducing the resistance, but it seems like the mycorrhizae are increasing the ability of rice to tolerate or withstand that infestation by rice pests. And of course, this is something that we'll need to look at and confirm in coming field seasons. So some conclusions about the soil amendments. Soil amendments can clear, and mycorrhizae in particular, can clearly change the resistance phenotype of plants in the field. Uh, and mycorrhizae appear to increase the susceptibility to rice pests, but they may also increase tolerance to insect injury. Now we've, also, so in addition to this mycorrhizae work, we've also done experiments using soil silicon amendments, and those also show some promise for increasing plant resistance. Okay, just to wrap up here, I know I'm just about out, about, a time, out about out of time. What are the implications of plant phenotypic plasticity for pest management? Just suggesting some ideas here. First of all, early season herbivory might alter the susceptibility of plants to subsequent herbivores. What implications might that have? Well, it might, uh, it might uh, increase the need for or, or change the need for scouting procedures or how you go about scouting. It might make management interventions like insecticides more necessary or less necessary. And there's this possibility that early season injury might harden plants uh, to uh, late season herbivory. Didn't seem to work in rice, but uh, other, other crops might be different. Uh, phenotypic plasticity, might, you might be able to directly manipulate phenotypic plasticity by treating with plant hormones or other elicitors. And again, at least in rice, we're seeing that more work is needed to determine when benefits of phytohormone treatments exceed the costs. And then finally, clearly the soil environment of crops can be manipulated to alter the resistance and, toler and or tolerance of crop plants. So we see mycorrhizae alters the resistance of rice. It increases the susceptibility to pests, but it may increase tolerance. And then other research suggests that silicon can be used to directly stimulate rice resistance and the resistance of other crops and prime rice for greater responsiveness. So again, just to, to kind of conclude here, manipulating the phenotype of crop plants may be a way to optimize the expression of plant resistance when varietal resistance is weak, but more research is going to be needed to determine the implications for IPM. Um, we're just beginning this work really in rice and clearly I've outlined uh, several needs for future research in rice. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll end the talk and um, take any questions you might have. I know I little, went a little bit over, but not too bad. So thank you for your attention. Thank you again for inviting me. And again, I'd like to acknowledge my graduate students, you can see here, that did all of this work and uh, my funding sources and also the Rice Research Station where uh, most of this work was done. And I'm not sure how, I see I have some questions here. <clears throat> Hi, Rajni. She says, great talk, thank you. And she says she's wondering if soil microbiome can impact the mycorrhizae. So right, so all the work that we've done <clears throat> is just involved with, with uh, manipulating one aspect of the microbiome, the mycorrhizae. We haven't yet gotten into the effects that mycorrhizal amendments might have on uh, other aspects of the microbiome, bacteria and so on. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it is, it's uh, very possible that mycorrhizae are altering the entire soil microbiome community. Uh, another question was, how open are rice growers to alternative non-insecticidal control tactics? Uh, yeah, that's a, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, not very right now. Uh, we're still uh, very much a, a very traditional and conventional uh, pest management approach on, for farmers. 
I think you'd have to do uh, quite a bit of, of convincing to have them have most of the farmers adopt these kinds of, of tactics. Although I will say over the last couple of weeks, I've gotten a couple of calls from rice farmers who uh, are interested in regenerative agriculture and those types of things. And so there is a minority of rice farmers that are open to this kind of thing. Uh, another question is, have you looked at the effects of salicylic acid on rice water weevil? And no, we have not. I had a visiting scientist that did a little bit of work on uh, salicylic acid, exogenous salicylic acid, and its effects on rice stink bug, which is a, a sucking pest that attacks rice in the reproductive stages, feeds on developing panicles. And she saw some effects at fairly high concentrations of salicylic acid. And um, I think I'm supposed to meet with you a little bit later and we can talk about those experiments. Dr. Long says, uh, might the mycorrhizae increase weevil success via increased biomass of roots and shoots relative to the phenology of these weevils in the field, i.e. more roots when larvae are present and feeding then more shoots when adults are looking for egg laying sites. And I think that that's a very good suggestion. Uh, it's one of the things that we had thought about. We have not yet done the experiments we would need to do to tease out the effects of the increased biomass relative to other types of, of potential mechanisms like changes in secondary metabolism. So I think that's a great suggestion. I think we just haven't done the experiments yet. Have you played around with wild germplasm for HPR in rice? And uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, this is an insect that has, been, that has been a pest in rice for as long as rice has been grown in Louisiana, which is about 100 years. And um, there have been a number of, a number of experiments since the early 60s, looking at various genotypes from uh, various geographic locations, as well as um, some of the wild progenitors of rice, uh, Ariza rufa pogon, longestemina, and um, nothing really jumps out. I, ha I personally haven't done work with wild progenitors. Um, because I haven't gotten the permits that you need to do those types of experiments. But I have looked at hundreds of different potential uh, genotypes from various geographic locations. You can find low levels of resistance. A lot of that resistance is found in, in um, germplasm that I would generously call unimproved. In other words, uh, the breeders won't touch it because it, the rice is so different, the growth habit and so on, is so different than rice that we grow here in Louisiana. And so breeders aren't really interested in trying to introgress low levels of resistance uh, using germplasm that's pretty gnarly in terms of its growth habit and so on. So yeah, um, but it, it, I think um, it, it, that is a good suggestion that some of the progenitors uh, and, and I actually actually have some CSSL lines from uh, Ariza longestemonata that we're going to test this next field season. So the answer is is a little bit, but we could probably do more. All right, I have a quick question, and sure. I can't seem to put an answer. A voice. A so somebody's it's, it's, it's weird giving a talk where you don't hear anybody's voice. Hi, Emily. <gasps> yeah. So the methyl jasminate so that you apply it early in the season. I think. Have you guys thought about using that as looking for like a control method for fall armyworm since it's it de degrades over time? Um, it might be better at the beginning. Yeah, so uh, so fall armyworm uh, in terms of seed treatment or in terms of of uh, um, foliar applications? Uh, methyl jasmine is like a seed treatment. Uh, yeah. We haven't looked at the effects of seed treatments on on um, Fall armyworm, but we have looked at foliar applications, and um, you can induce resistance to fall armyworm with foliar applications. It's not a dramatic effect. So mm -hmm. fall armyworm, 
seems to be a, a pest that isn't all that sensitive to jasminate induced changes. Huh. Bummer. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any other last minute questions? We have a couple of minutes. I'm not seeing anything. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Stout. And yeah, I think. Well, thank you all for coming oh. and thanks for, for sticking with me to the end. Appreciate it.